Hello, everyone. Thanks again for joining us on the second panel session of today. It's a very interesting topic, if I may say so myself. We are talking about the future of the seed industry, an industry that is at the very beginning of the food system. We want to get some key insights from the seed companies, the farmers and the grain trade about our recent experience. In particular, we are interested to hear how the current situation sets the scene for the future of the seed sector and what opportunities and challenges we see down the road. We have, again, a remarkable set of panelists today, and you've heard their opening statements in the previous session. Now we have them live to answer your questions. So on Zoom, um, you have a Q&A button for our audiences where you can send your comments and your questions for our speakers. So let me introduce them quickly. Uh, joining us from Buenos Aires, we have the president of Semillas Basso and president of the Argentine Seed Association, Ms. Lorena Basso. We are pleased to have with us the CEO of Lima Grand Vegetable Seeds, Mr. Frank Berger. And calling us from Normandy, France, we have the treasurer of the World Farmers Organization, Mr. Arnold Push Dalisac. And calling in from London, we have the executive director of the International Grains Council, Mr. Arnaud Petit. Um, Frank, I'd like to give you the first question. In your statement, you said uh, that the seed business is global by nature, but local in essence. Um, you also talked about how consumers have changed their minds about food production uh, as a result of COVID and making them more aware of the importance of food supply. So I wanna ask you, how do you position your company in terms of responding to changing consumer demands? Uh, thank you, Francine. That's a, that's a pretty uh, wide, uh, wide open question. Maybe two elements of answers here. The first thing is that we have seen, and I guess this is not only in France, it's in many countries, that uh, during the crisis, people have resorted to very much staple food. At Limagrin, besides being seeds, people were also bread makers. And we have seen the demand in bread increasing a lot. I think the pasta makers have also seen that uh, there was a very, very high demand. So we see people going to uh, to a staple food. So um, as uh, we'll be also discussing with Arnaud, the, the grain trade, it is very evident that everything which is basic food, staple food, um, is playing an important role and that the people in the world have really, uh, um, surely at least in, the, I would say, uh, the Western Hemisphere, again, uh, uh, a new uh, recognition for how important it is to have a, a direct access to this uh, staple food. Besides this, we have also seen that uh, uh, there was a, a fairly big demand in, in vegetables or consumption, but here again, we build a bit less fancy products and more basic products. And, and the third thing is that there has been quite a, uh, I would say a trend or a call for what's called more recolization of the food uh, of the food production. And this is where actually one of the uh, key nature of the seed business comes to play. Because as uh, you mentioned, I stated that the seed business is global by nature, but local by essence. And the reason is that what we are trying to do as seed people is always to find the best product to be produced at the right place that is suitable not only to the consumer demand, but is also best suited for the technical conditions in which, in, in, in which it is grown. And uh, sometimes uh, people who are not uh, so familiar with our business who are maybe opposing a little bit what we do, uh, consider that we do a one size fits all uh, as far as creating new products. And there's, there cannot be something more different from what it is we actually do. There is no one size fits all. There is a, a given rapeseed variety. I see rapeseed behind Arno, a given rapeseed variety that works well for Denmark, but will not work well for the South of France. And likewise, uh, if you are a consumer of melon, what you call a melon in France is very different from what you call a melon in Japan or in Central America. So diversity is always the key word. And I think this uh, will not change in the future. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Lorena, I'd like to get your perspective mm -hmm. on this as well. Um, as the head of a family-owned company that has been there for more than 80 years, um, do you see as well uh, a need to respond to changing consumer demands in South America and in the markets where you are acting? Uh, thank you, Francine. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very early to know if the changes uh, we are seeing are going to stay for long. 
But at the time that the corvid arrived in our region, we have just started the vegetable planting season in the north of our country. I'm talking about in Argentina. And what happened is that the farmers keep mm -hmm. the area planting and also increase a little bit. That, has, that, that, has, that was a surprise for me. Um, why that happened? Uh, I think that in big cities as Buenos Aires and same happening in other cities in the region, I'm talking about San Pablo or uh, Santiago, people used to have lunch in work time, they, but now they stay at home and they consume homemade food. And I think that they are more conscious about healthy food. Uh, that's why I think the, the increase of the consumption. There are, few, there are a few changes in the vegetable commercial chain. Before uh, COVID, the vegetable buying was through a small store, uh, but nowadays it's managed by the supermarket that they have delivery. That is why uh, that happened. Also, there are new business related to the premium delivery of vegetable. So quality and healthy vegetable delivery at home is a great idea. I think that it's an improve and it's going to stay for the future. Thanks, Lorena. And now I want to ask the farmer's perspective on this. Um, Arnold, do you see a consumer perception impacting your business as a farmer? Uh, excuse me. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, we, we have seen that the, the, the consumer uh, is now more aware and more uh, Interesting by what uh, he, uh, he eat and uh, is interesting by, by local food, of course, more and more. Uh, but uh, as uh, Lorena say, he, 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 he cook again. Some people uh, have stopped to cook during a, uh, a, a long time because now the, the apartment and more and more small and uh, the kitchen uh, means nothing now sometimes. And uh, it's really a, a new way of life for, for the consumer. And it's really, it's a good choice for the farmer to, to be in relation uh, with the consumer and by, with the help of all the food chain uh, to convince that the, the produce we made not far from him is a, is a good produce. Also, when it's made uh, far from, uh, from the consumer also. But... Uh, as uh, I, I, I can't speak anymore, sorry. Uh, as a French farmer and as a, uh, also a treasurer of the, the world farmer, I have the, these two uh, ideas to manage at the same time, local production and international uh, market. Now, I want to touch on the perspective of the grain trade. And this question is for Arno. Uh, do you see, do you observe any difference in the reaction of governments this year in 2020 in comparison to how they reacted in 2008 when the world was hit by the economic crisis? Yes, thank you for, for your question. And definitely there is a different approach from the government. First of all, in 2008, it was more a crisis on the supply side. And today it's more an issue of logistics. Uh, and now the demand, as we are looking about where the demand in food, feed and industrial use will go for the grain sector. So that's the first point. The second point is about logistics. Uh, it is right that the governments try to apply new or innovations in a way to provide certificates for exports. So we have seen the e-digital e or e-commerce developing e even for the, for the administration. And the last point is before the COVID-19, we had already some trade disruption, uh, just to remind the dispute between the US and China. So. The issue of having some decision from countries to uh, put some tariffs or to uh, uh, stop uh, exports, that's something what's before COVID. I would say the, the crisis has not necessarily generated something new. What we have to look for the future, and we had a discussion yesterday in Council with all the members, is how the countries will change the mind about the domestic support to agriculture. And that's something new in, in inputs, I would say, for the common agricultural policy, but also for policy elsewhere in the US or, or in other countries. Where the domestic support will go? Is it about production side? Is it about value chain? Uh, because we talk about a lot about local production. 
that's something we will need to look forward for the future and how the governments will uh, develop this approach, avoiding, I would say, the impact on global trade. Thanks for that. And I would like to continue on the direction um, of talking about government response and policy. And this question is for you, Frank. Um, speaking about innovation at the European level and um, you've been president of the French Seed Union as well, so you've had experience in, in, in government and policy um, engagement. Um, the EU decision is said to impact our overall capacity to innovate as a seed sector. Um, we are looking for predictable science-based rules. Uh, how do you see this unfolding in the future? Thank you, Francine. Uh, another, another difficult one, but uh, I will try to answer to, to my best uh, knowledge. Uh, when you talk about the EU decision, um, I suppose you are referring to the uh, decision of the European Court of Justice last year, which has deemed uh, anything which is not classical selection basically as, uh, as a GMO with a few exceptions. And we had uh, some more rebounds of this decision uh, in France, which are, we are still trying to, to cope with. Um, and all over the world, uh, we are seeing uh, new regulation taking place uh, to uh, craft uh, the appropriate uh, regulatory landscape concerning what is called new breeding techniques, uh, which is uh, an acronym basically for what is known today as, uh, as genome editing or gene editing. And gene editing is basically something uh, to create uh, new opportunities, new invention, uh, speeding up uh, natural mutation, a system of natural mutations that creates more diversity and more viability. So, of course, um, as, a, as, a, as a French seed industry and as the Magrin, we are extremely concerned with the fact that apparently the European Union is not working at the same pace as other uh, regulators are all over the, all over the world. We are seeing new regulations uh, popping up uh, here and there. And uh, we are um, actually pleading uh, uh, very significantly with our own government and at the level of the European uh, Commission to make sure that uh, in the years to come, we will have a regulatory uh, framework that will uh, give all its uh, space, the appropriate space to these new uh, technologies. These technologies are not here to solve everything, uh, to bring uh, overall solutions everywhere. They are part of the toolbox of breeders and can bring additional solutions where the classical ways of breeding are hitting some uh, hard rocks, are hitting difficulties that they cannot superate. But I think uh, the, the COVID crisis has uh, told us that uh, the keeping pace with innovation is extremely important. Uh, when you think on uh, how uh, hastily uh, medical laboratories are now trying to race to find a vaccine uh, to, the, to, uh, to, the, to the virus, it means that uh, in, there is a big outcry for innovation here and for a rush to innovation. And we want to make sure that whenever such kind of a rush also happens in the world of food, the regulatory landscape will not take months and years to change so that we can appropriately bring the answers that the farmers and the consumers will need. Thanks, Frank. Um, Mr. Puesh Dalisak, um, in, at the end of your speech, you mentioned mm. also the EU decision and the impact it may have on European farmers. Um, as a farmer, what are your needs um, in, to address the future challenges to agriculture, and how do you want to see this reflected into policy making? In Europe, we, we have now two strategies who are uh, a new challenge for, for the farmer. It's the farm to fork and uh, it's the biodiversity strategy. Uh, we call that globally uh, the Green Deal in Europe. Um, uh, with that, the, the, the European Commission uh, want to uh, develop uh, agriculture with less inputs and th that will be very difficult. That's why the seeds can be a, a, a solution. If we want to use less pesticide, we need uh, less fungicide, less insecticide, we need to have the, the more resistant uh, seeds as possible. And it's uh, by the, the technology of the seeds that we, that we can have a, an answer. At the same time, we want to, to keep more and more biodiversity, more and more set aside area. Uh, and uh, if we want to produce the same volume, the same quantity of grain at the same time, or, or feed uh, globally, or food uh, globally, uh, we need uh, to have the, the best technology as possible. And in the seeds, uh, we have the way 
uh, to uh, answer at, the, at these two uh, deals at the same time. I, I remember that uh, 40 years ago, uh, we uh, were on my, on my farm at five tons of wheat per hectare. Now we have 10 tons. It's not at all the same varieties of uh, seeds that we use. And if, if tomorrow we want to continue to progress, to feed more and more people with less and less area, uh, to keep uh, the more biodiversity as possible beside our field, we need to have the best seed as possible. And, and cheaper, please. Thanks for that. Um, one of the one of the things we've observed um, during COVID nineteen was was a revival of of dialogue between the seed sector and the government, especially in declaring seed as an essential service. Um, and Lorena, you've talked about the role of seed associations in initiating dialogue with government and policymakers. Could you share with us some ongoing actions from ASA to talk to the ministries and at the end, um, give farmers access to seed? Yes, of course. Uh, the mandatory quarantine began on March 19, uh, yes, ni uh, 19, that is end of the summer in our place. So uh, companies, seed companies and farmers were in the middle of their harvest. So that, that was our situation. Yesterday, uh, we had an audience with the agriculture minister and the agriculture secretary, and we talked about that. Because for the beginning, we, we were together private and public sector to ensure that the supply of seed, uh, we need to, supply, to, to ensure the supply of seeds for the next seasons. We'll build up an uh, industry core beer protocol that is uh, the added of the best practices of the companies that are in, the, in our association and other industries to do our best because for, for us, protocols and responsibility are the way to go in, in this situation. Uh, we have a lot of difficulties or problems that came to us a virtual office every day. Uh, I don't want to bother you with problems, but uh, we have uh, difficulties with the custom service, especially in imports. We solve. We have problems to drive workers to their homes because they finish their duty uh, at the field that, and they have to move to another province or another state. Um, we solve. We have problems to move and we solve that. So that could happen because we build up a relation with the authority every day. We believe that the relation has to be based on trust, and in my point of view, that is the only way to trust, to put trust in the middle. Thank you, Lorena, well said. Um, now I want to ask um, Mr. Petit, um, knowing that in grain trade, the interdependency of countries is a very real thing, um, and that there is key to maintain uh, the flow of grain to attain food security. Uh, do you see opportunities for further collaboration and exchanges between the seed sector and the grain trade sector? Yes. Um, if when we talk about trade, we talk about food security. When we talk about seeds, we talk about life. So we see definitively there is a, a close connection between between the two uh, thematics and, and the two organizations. Uh, the first thing, and it has been mentioned by both by Frank and uh, Arnold Puech, Dalisak, the issue of yields. And uh, as we see, the need for increasing production is clearly uh, a need for the future. Uh, in the last 10 years, indeed, we have increased the production in tonnage by, one, by 1, 000, 100 million tons of grains, total grains. So it's not a, it's not a small numbers we are talking about. So definitively, how the, the seed sector is looking, the issue of inter intensification of production is something very important. The second point, and we talk about, we talk already about the demand side, how the demand is moving. I think it's very important. Uh, we, at the moment, we are working a lot about the policy sector. Uh, we are seeing a, a tremendous increase of global trade on policies, and I think it will be also important to look together between the seed sector and the global trade, how policies could be a next step of food we need really to, to look at. Um, and when we talk about grains, we usually talk about breads, so meaning food, but we have to bear in mind that the main bulk of grains is going to feed sector, 
And there, the, the development of the livestock sector in the next decade will be very relevant. And in that way, we can have some surprise in terms of prices because like with economic turmoil, we don't know if the demand of meat will be, will be so high like, as we have seen in the past. So it can make some pressures uh, to the grain sector in the future. So and here again, I think if we can collaborate between ISF and IGC, sharing more market intelligence would be very useful for the both side. And the last point I think we have to also to look at um, farmers are producing, but they are not trading in dollar. You know, when we talk about global trade, we, we talk always about dollar per ton, but uh, farmers in Argentina are not producing in dollar per ton. They are producing with their local currency. And that's also something we have to look is how the movement of local currencies can incentivize. I would, I would like to say, for example, in South America, definitively the local currency movement has incentivized the farmers to produce more. Uh, in comparison to other regions in the world where the movement of local currency can penalize the farmers to produce more. That's also something we have to look and could have an impact in the future for the trade, but I think also for the seed sector. So I think there is different uh, area where we can exchange information and interact. We had a, a seminar a few weeks ago together uh, with the fertilizer industry also, and I think if the supply chain can continue to exchange further, it will be maybe the main lesson of the COVID-19 crisis is we need to share information if we want to have a global resilient uh, system. Thank you. Thanks for that. And now we have time to answer some of the questions that are coming in from the audience. And I think this one would be interesting for you, Frank. Um, someone is asking us, does the current pandemic accelerate the trend to more local or regional food production? Uh, some supermarkets and retailers are focusing on promoting locally produced vegetables and fruits. If this is the trend, uh, does that require breeding for new varieties adopted to local conditions? Uh, the answer is definitely yes. Uh, now, the question, the other question to this, the secondary question, will be to which extent and in which direction will uh, will this go? Uh, again, uh, I'm, I don't want to uh, emphasize too much on this, but uh, breeding is always uh, local by nature. So, if uh, tomorrow uh, we, as a seed industry, and particularly in the vegetable area, we are told that uh, we should uh, no longer breed for varieties grown in southern Europe to deliver to the markets of northern Europe, but we have to to bring varieties that would be more adapted for the growing condition of Northern Europe, definitely this is something that uh, will be on our plate. It actually already is, is uh, on our plate. The question then just will be to how you adjust your, your efforts and your resources depending on the various uh, markets, let's call them markets, that uh, you want uh, you want to address. But uh, I think that uh, over the years, the seed industry, be it in, in raw crops and vegetables, has always demonstrated that adapting is basically fundamentally what, uh, what we do. So maybe there is a new uh, paradigm which has been brought by the COVID-19 that certain crops will be partially relocalized because I don't think all the crop uh, will be uh, relocalized. And of course, we will be there with the, uh, with the answer. Thank you for that. And uh, now I have a question on contingency plans. Um, and Lorena, you might want to answer this one. Um, COVID-19 um, came and um, did we, as a seed sector, do you feel that we had enough contingency plans to respond to this? Um, and how are we preparing for future crisis like this in the future? Yes, I think the way we, are, we were not prepared because the COVID was like a tsunami that came to us. But I think that the companies are very conscious about the how to do things and to do things in the best way. Um, and about the core beer, what we do, we prepare protocols um, and we put together the best idea in the same sheet and we go we go ahead. And I think that we are doing the things as best as we can. Um, because we have to protect our people and we have to protect others um, to have an operation with a very low risk. And I think that we are doing a good job 
Thanks for that. I'm seeing a question here um, for Arno Petit, um, and it's it's quite specific um, to grains. And he's asking, with the changing climate scenario, especially drought in recent years, what is your comment about grain sorghum taking over the area of maize, which is more drought tolerant and saves serves the same purpose as maize? Um, I would say what we see for the moment is more um, intensification of corn production, meaning through harvest, and even in Brazil now, in some regions, uh, moving to even three harvest a year. So, um, and the second point we have also to bear in mind is the feed sector is a complex uh, chain. So it's not just to bring the corn to the cow, if, if I may say so. You have a processing industry be, uh, between the two, the two aspects. And um, we see that on ethanol uh, industry, on biofuels, indeed you have some mandates uh, in place in several regions. So the demand will continue. It will be continue to be a driver. So that means the DDGS, which is uh, the outlet for the, uh, for, the feed, uh, in the, for the feed industry will continue. So. Um, we are not sure that indeed that the climate change will be a, a driver enough, I would say, to change the, the area of production in maize. Uh, but what, it, what we see definitively, and we have been very surprised last year uh, when the U.S. had uh, been hit by a dramatic uh, weather events, uh, indeed the potential of genetics in maize has improved tremendously. Uh, Everybody thought that U.S. would make a, a poor harvest, and at the end they finished the harvest at a reasonable level. So I think what we have to look and uh, here it's more uh, to the benefit of the seed industry is how the, is all the genetic potential has improved in the last years and what it's still possible to do. Maize is definitely the only one crops where we see both uh, acreage and yields increasing year on year. Thanks for that. And I would ask uh, Mr. Puesh Dalisak to add a little bit to this um, conversation on shifting to crops that are more drought resistant, climate resistant. Um, what do you see is, is the future of this for farmers? We are uh, at WFO engaged with the ISF in the, the climate makers. It's important to, to know and to share all the practice done by the farmer and all the knowledge uh, developed uh, by the seed industry uh, to, to the farmer. We need to be more and more efficient. I have speak just before of the, the wheat on my farm. I, I can speak of the flax this year. We, I am in the best area in the world for the production of flax. And uh, during uh, my young age, we have always the same varieties. Now in this industry, we have 100 different varieties uh, possible to use on the farm. And now we have a, a dry, long season with something new for Normandy, who is more well known by some uh, lovely rain. Uh, and, uh, and now with this dry season, we need to have the, the, the right uh, varieties in front of this uh, new climate. And because uh, we have this solution, we are able to be uh, efficient on the market. That's uh, an example of the efficiency of the, the research. And we need to continue to develop that. And uh, all the public money and all the private money need to work together. The most joint venture uh, we can make will be a solution for everybody. Thanks for that. We've been receiving a lot of um, of questions here, and I wish we had more time to address them all. But um, unfortunately, we have to wrap up. So I would ask for some final statements from our speakers. Um, we've talked today about um, what you see as the future of the seed sector and the opportunities and the challenges we see down the road. Um, just very quickly. How would you how would you conclude um, the future? Uh, what is the vision of the future for the seed industry? I'd like to start with Frank. Well, I think the future is bright. Um, we uh, we have this industry has demonstrated uh, over the years 
that uh, by uh, really uh, targeting uh, the, um, the real questions, which is how to produce uh, more and how to produce more efficiently by using uh, the resources in a wise manner, that uh, we can actually uh, grow uh, in a sustainable manner. Uh, this uh, the, the, the food, uh, help grow the food that, that the world uh, needs. And I think this mission will uh, be a lasting one. There is no reason that there would be change. Of course, there are changes, there are new paradigms, the new demand. Really, the question about uh, use, uh, efficient use of the resources, how to better transform the nitrogen, how to be more resilient to drought and these kind of things is a new, are new and complex uh, traits that we need uh, to address. And I think, uh, I believe this industry has the uh, intellectual, uh, scientific, and also the ability from the resource standpoint to address uh, these uh, challenges. But for this, we also need uh, to be, I would say, supported and helped by uh, adequate set of uh, regulations, uh, regulations in terms of innovation and also uh, regulations in terms of uh, movement of seed. Uh, we are, I think, a very responsible industry and we want to see that we are also taken as such by uh, all the relevant uh, national organizations that uh, regulate the movement. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Lorena? Yes, I agree about the what Frank said. So I, I want to add that uh, for our company, thinking about our companies, um, what is uh, we, what we learn about that is for me are three things. First is uh, we need people to focus on goals. That is very important. We have to think in objectives, not in processes. We have to be flexible. The company have to be flexible to to look other other opportunities because uh, I think that uh, doors will open for everyone. And then the technology, the technology apply in the business, the technology apply on the on the seat. I think that our responsibility is to put all the innovation in, in the seat and to offer the best we have to solve the problems of the farmers. Thank you very much. Arno Petit, would you like to uh, give a final statement? Yeah, thank you. Um, so as it has been stated, um, indeed the, the future is bright in a way that the demand will in food will continue to increase. Uh, and I would say particularly for regions like Africa, where we know that they will need more imports, even if they can produce more, that means they will need more more food. And so in that way, trade and seeds have uh, interesting work to do uh, in order to uh, increase market and to work on uh, the freest trade possible. The second point I would like to highlight also is this uh, crisis uh, shows also the resilience of the global food system. Uh, indeed, today we cannot say there have been a lake of uh, food, uh, even for the ocean freight, everything is working well. Uh, Brazil is now exporting, uh, making a record in export in soybean, so despite the, the coronavirus crisis. So it means we have, a, we have a global resilient system now, and I would say it's more for the policy makers uh, to look the future and how they will like to set up uh, to respond to one part of the demand, which is the local production, but also having this global trade system and this global chain working. And that's, I feel, uh, it's very important to, to start discussion on it, and not only within the policy makers, but together with the private sector. This is why I'm very pleased that today I have an opportunity to discuss with you at ISF. Um, to tomorrow it will be with IGTC, the International Grain Trader Coalition, and I think that the most important that we can cross the views and to set up a new framework for the globalization to be more stable uh, for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Mr. Puesh Delisac. Your final statement, please. Climate change will continue. Ban of pesticide, ban of technology uh, decided by authority will continue even we are against. Uh, but, uh, and to find a, a solution with all these uh, new uh, limits, uh, it's, we need to continue to work together to, to find the, the solution, the farmer, uh, the, the research, and, uh, and, and the company. The public research, the private inter, uh, interest, like the private company, must to, to find 
the way to, 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 to produce the technology, the genetics that everybody needs. And it will be uh, the answer of all the food chain. Thank you so much. Well, that's all the time we have today. And uh, once again, I would like to thank our speakers for this very enriching discussion. And to those who joined us uh, via the Q&A in the chat, we will try our best to respond to all your questions. When you go to the ISF Virtual Congress platform on the live chat, um, the ISF Secretariat will be there to, to respond to you. Um, and just a reminder to our audiences that yesterday's and this morning's sessions are available on demand if you log into the ISF Virtual Congress platform. And we will see you again tomorrow for another very interesting topic, re-examining innovation after COVID-19. Thanks, everyone, and see you there.